ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد Today then we begin with the statement of Imam Al-Tahawi Rahimahullah Ta'ala وَمَنْ أَحْسَنَ الْقَوْلَ فِي أَصْحَابِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَأَزْوَاجِهِ الطَّاهِرَاتِ مِنْ كُلِّ دَنَسِ وَذُرِّيَّاتِهِ الْمُقَدَّسِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ رِجْسِ فَقَدْ بَرِئَ مِنَ النِّفَاقِ that whomsoever speaks good of the companions of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whoever speaks good of the companions of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and about his pure wives removing from them any evil and of his children, removing them from any impurity, then that person has declared his innocence and freedom from any hypocrisy. Meaning, that it is from our methodology, our understanding, that we speak good of all of the companions of the Prophet wasallam. We speak good of the family of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Speak good of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, of the children of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And that is mentioned in a hadith where it says, "Amma ba'd." أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ فَإِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ يُوشِكُ أَنْ يَأْتِيَنِي رَسُولُ رَبِّي فَأُجِيبُ رَبِّي وَأَنِّي تَارِكٌ فِيكُمْ ثَقَلَيْنِ أَوَّلَهُمَا كِتَابَ اللَّهِ فِيهِ الْهُدَى وَالنُّورِ فَخُذُوا بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَاسْتَمْسَكُوا بِهِ فَحَثَّ عَلَى كِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَرَغَّبَ فِيهِ ثم قال وأهل بيتي أذكركم الله في أهل بيتي ثلاثا In this hadith the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم mentions وأني تارك فيكم ثقلين that I am going to leave behind two heavy things <coughs> when death comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he mentions, يُوشِكُ أَنْ يَأْتِيَنِي رَسُولُ رَبِّي That it's very close that the messenger of my Lord may come to me, in reference to Jibreel, uh, in reference to the angel of death, coming to take his soul. So he said, I'm going to leave two things behind. First of them is the book of Allah. In it is guidance and light. So take the book of Allah and cling on to it. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned the Qur'an, the book of Allah. And of course, the second is the sunnah. But then he also mentioned here, as the second, وَأَهْلَ بَيْتِي And the people of my home, my family, أُذَكِّرُكُمُ اللَّهِ فِي أَهْلِ بَيْتِي That I remind you regarding the family of my home. So here the Prophet wasallam was reminding us regarding the virtue of his family also and that we love and respect and speak good of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the mothers of the believers, 
and that we similarly speak good of his children, his offspring, all of that from the companions, then we hold them in high regard and we speak good of them, and we free them from any type of evil and impurity that the people of innovation and deviation have accused them of. And so the one who does that, holds them in high regard and respect and love, then that individual has freed himself from any hypocrisy. As for the ones who do speak evil of them, Ibn Abi al-Izz al-Hanafi mentions, the Rafida for example, you see from amongst them, that they have some evil speech towards some of the companions, and you see others from the various sects also having evil speech towards the companions. But what we've learned from this section is that we love and we honor the companions of the Prophet wasallam, And we do not speak evil of them, we do not try to pick out faults with them. We do not try to pick out shortcomings that may have occurred. That is not from our methodology to do so. The people of innovation are the ones who spend time delving into those affairs, trying to pick out shortcomings and faults of the companions. And some of them, they do that in order to be able to justify their own evils. So you have Al-Ikhwan Al-Muslimun, the Ikhwanis who purposely try to find faults in the companions. And they do that to try and say to you, look, the companions had faults. And they may have advised each other about those faults, but they never refuted each other and abandoned each other. They never did those things. They continued to cooperate and be good to each other. So they try and find these types of examples where there may be some faults or shortcomings or deficiencies. And they say, but look, even though these faults existed, the companions didn't make boycott of each other. They didn't go refuting each other. So now, even though the Muslim Ummah, we may have some differences and faults, we shouldn't refute anyone or have any type of enmity to anyone. That's what they want to try and do. So they want to try and justify it by delving into and picking faults in the companions. And we know and we've learned that is not the way of Ahlul Sunnah to purposely try to find faults with the companions, to purposely try to find shortcomings with the companions, just so that you can justify your faults and your shortcomings and your wrongs. That's what they want to do, the people of innovation. They want justification for their wrongs. So they try and find whatever loose examples they can, to try and say that this is something based upon the way of the companions, and it never is. So we do not look for faults of the companions, we do not look for errors of the companions, we don't look for shortcomings of the companions, rather we speak of them in good and respect and honor, and we love them. Then Imam al-Tahawi says, وعلماء السلف من السابقين ومن بعدهم من التابعين أهل الخير والأثر وأهل الفقه والنظر لا يذكرون إلا بالجميل ومن ذكرهم بسوء فهو على غير السبيل He says and the scholars of the salaf the scholars of the early Salaf and those who came after them from the Tabi'een, the students of the Sahaba, those early great scholars, the Salaf and the people of righteousness, the people of the narrations, 
the people of knowledge and insight, they are not to be mentioned except with goodness. Those great scholars, we only speak of them in goodness. Great imams that went by before, famous imams that many people know, famous imams from the time of the Salaf, those great imams, we only speak of them in good. The Salaf, the Sahaba, their students, the Tabi'een, their students, Tabi'een, we only speak of them in goodness. وَمَنْ ذَكَرَهُمْ بِسُوءٍ فَهُوَ عَلَى غَيْرِ السَّبِيلِ Whomsoever speaks about them in evil, then that person is not upon the correct and upright pathway. A person who speaks ill of the Salaf, speaks evil of the companions, of the students of the companions, <coughs> the righteous Salaf from those times, the one who speaks evil of them is not upon the correct pathway. It's mentioned in the Quran, وَمَن يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولَ مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُصْلِهِ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَأَتْ مَصِيرًا <coughs> In this ayah, Allah mentions that he who opposes the messenger after the guidance has become clear and follows a path other than the path of the believers and follows a path other than the path of the believers, then that person we will place him in the fire. In the ayah we being told those who oppose the messenger, the guidance, and they follow a path other than the path of the believers. Who are these believers being referenced in this ayah? That you follow the path of other than the believers. Who are these believers being spoken of? The Sahaba. It is in reference to the Sahaba. That if you follow a path other than the path of the Sahaba, then those people are not upon the upright pathway. They are not upon the correct methodology. فَيَجِبُ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ بَعْدَ مَوَالَاتِ بَعْدَ مَوَالَاتِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ مُوَالَاتِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كَمَا نَطَقَ بِهِ الْقُرْآنِ So after... A person, he has his allegiance and following of Allah and his messenger. Then on top of that is the companions. On top of that is your allegiance to the companions. Your love and respect for the companions. Just as the Qur'an is telling us that we must follow them. خُصُوصًا الَّذِينَ هُمْ وَرَثَةُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ Especially them who are from the inheritors of the prophets, the scholars, the great imams, the inheritors of the prophets, الَّذِينَ جَعَلَهُمُ اللَّهُ بِمَنْزِلَةِ النُّجُومِ Those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made at the level of or equivalent of in comparison to the stars, يُهْتَدَى بِهِمْ Because you guide yourself via them. You guide yourself via those stars. فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ In the darkness of the land and sea. In the darkness of the land and sea. You can be guided by those stars. And that is the example given of the scholars. The people of knowledge, you are guided by them. وَقَدْ أَجْمَعَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ عَلَى هِدَايَتِهِمْ وَدِرَايَتِهِمْ إِذْ كُلُّ أُمَّةٍ قَبْلَ مَبْعَثِ مُحَمَّدَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ عُلَمَاءُهُ وَشِرَارُهَا إِلَّا الْمُسْلِمِينَ If you take note that 
the previous nations, all of the scholars were evil. The previous nations, their scholars were evil, <coughs> misguiding their people. The scholars of the Jews and the Christians, etc. But as for this ummah, the scholars of this ummah, the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, then they guide the people to the truth. They guide the people to righteousness and they are the best of the people. فَإِنَّهُمْ خُلَفَاءُ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ أُمَّتِ They are the inheritors, those who take on that leadership after the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم وَالْمُحْيُونَ لِمَا مَاتَ مِنْ سُنَّتِهِ And those scholars, they are the ones who revive what has died or been forgotten and lost from the sunnah. فَبِهِمْ قَامَ الْكِتَابِ وَبِهِ قَامُوا And via them, the Qur'an, the book of Allah is upright and spread amongst the people and practiced. And the people, they are upright via that Qur'an. وَبِهِمْ نَطَقَ الْكِتَابِ وَبِهِ نَطَقُوا وَكُلُّهُمْ مُتَّفِقُونَ اتِّفَاقًا يَقِينًا عَلَى وُجُوبِ اتِّبَاعِ الرَّسُولِ صَلَى اللَّهُ all of those great scholars are absolutely united upon having to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لكن إذا وجد إذا وجد لواحد منهم قول قد جاء حديث صحيح بخلافه. So now there we're talking about the great scholars, the scholars of أهل السنة والجماعة. That you follow the scholars and you love the scholars. They are the inheritors of the prophets, the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah. Does that mean that they can never make an error? Of course not. The scholars may make an error. It may occur because the Prophet ﷺ said, "Kullu bani Adam khatta." All of the sons of Adam make error. Nobody has absolute protection from that. So it could be sometimes that a scholar you find from him a statement that is in opposition to some authentic hadith, in opposition to some authentic sunnah. So in that situation, what do we say? How do we react to a situation where one of the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah may have made some statement and it can occur that is in opposition that is in opposition to the sunnah somehow there could be three explanations for this firstly it could be that the particular scholar is unaware of that particular hadith. A scholar may say something is halal, even though there's a hadith saying it's haram. But it could be that the scholar never knew about that particular hadith. Scholars, great knowledge, but doesn't mean they know every single thing. So maybe that ruling the scholar gave is because he just wasn't aware of some particular narration. Maybe. That could be one reason. Another reason, that the scholar, when he makes that statement, it could be in reference to a different context. He may be talking about something and you think it's in opposition to what the Sunnah is saying. But maybe what he is saying is in reference to some different context. And so the ruling is different. So your state, your, the statement of the scholar, you may not fully understand it and the context of what it's being said in. And maybe that's why you think it's in opposition to the Sunnah. It could be that he is in reference he is referring to some other context, some other situation with the statement that he's making. 
Thirdly, it could be that the scholar knows the hadith, but still he makes a statement in opposite to it, because he may believe that the hadith is abrogated. Sometimes we know certain narrations get abrogated, meaning that a sunnah comes, but then it is cancelled. That happened at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. There used to be certain types of sunnah, but then they were later cancelled for different types of sunnahs. That happened because the revelation when it came to the Prophet ﷺ, did it come all in one go? It came over a period of 23 years. So maybe some of the revelation that came in the early stages was appropriate at the early stages of Islam for the Muslims at that time. But then 20 years later, as Islam developed, the ruling changed, a new ruling came. So the old ruling was cancelled. And the new ruling came. That's called abrogation. Sometimes that happens. It happens. There's an example in the sunnah regarding (coughs) ghusl. Initially, the ruling used to be that if intimacy occurs between the husband and the wife and penetration occurs but ejaculation does not occur then ghusl was not wajib that was initially initially that was the ruling initially intercourse could occur but let's say ejaculation did not occur then on that occasion now, ghusl was not obligatory. But then now we know later on the abrogation occurred. And the hadith mentions, إِذَا الْتَقَ الْخِتَانَانِ فَقَدْ وَجَبَ الْغُسْلِ If the private areas make contact, that's it, ghusl is now obligatory. If the private areas make contact between the husband and the wife, that's it, ghusl is now needed. Regardless of whether ejaculation or anything occurs. So that was an example of the ruling changing. Initially, there was no ghusl for that situation. But then afterwards, just upon contact now, ghusl is required. So that's abrogation. Maybe a scholar is giving a particular ruling because he believes there's an abrogation that's happened. And it hasn't though. So his statement ends up in opposition to what the sunnah is saying. There could be different reasons like that. Could be different reasons. But we came across a statement of Al-Imam Shafi'i before, if you remember, when we were talking about Al-Imam Malik, Al-Imam Shafi'i, Al-Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, all of the famous four schools of thought. None of them knew everything. None of them knew everything. They all knew a certain amount and they gave their teachings upon what they knew. Al-Imam Shafi'i and all of the others had said similar statements. They had mentioned that if you ever come across one of our statements that goes against what is in the authentic uh, sunnah, goes against what is in the revelation, then our statement we've made, throw it against the wall. Throw it away, chuck it away. Follow what's in the Quran and the sunnah. That's what they used to say. Yet nowadays people completely abandon this statement. They follow them blindly no matter what, even if it clearly opposes in some issue what the hadith is saying. They all used to say, if you find any of our statements opposing what's in the Quran and Sunnah, throw our statement against the wall, get rid of it, follow the Quran and the Sunnah. So we respect and we love the scholars and Allah has told us, to return back to the scholars, to return back to them when we are in need of asking about our religion. They are the inheritors of the prophets. So that is something important. And the scholars, they are alive. They are alive and they are always scholars there. You have now famous scholars who are alive. Sheikh Al-Fawzan, the Mufti, Sheikh Al-Hidan, Sheikh Rabi'ah. Many scholars are alive. So you can return back to those scholars with questions. Return back to them asking about the affairs of your religion. 
Asking when you don't know is important. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, Ni'ma nisa al-ansar. لم يكن يمنعهن حياؤهن من أن يسألن عن أمور دينهن. She said, "How good are the women of the Ansar? Their shyness never prevented them from asking about the affairs of their religion, because they used to go to the Prophet وسلم, asking about the period and how to pray and different things like that, personal things like that." Aisha رضي الله عنها said, "Good, excellent. How good these women are." They don't let their shyness stop them from finding out about the rules of their religion. They don't let their shyness stop them from finding out how to worship Allah and what to do. So, asking and returning back to the scholars, that is what is being mentioned here. Then, Al-Imam Al-Tahawi says, وَلَا نُفَضِّلُ أَحَدًا مِنَ الْأَوْلِيَاءِ على أحد من الأنبياء عليهم السلام ونقول نبي واحد أفضل من جميع الأولياء <coughs> that we do not we do not give preference to any one of the أولياء of Allah above any of the prophets One prophet, any one prophet will be better than all of the awliya of Allah. This is to highlight the different levels. The prophets and messengers are obviously higher level than everybody else. So anybody else who may be from the most pious, from the awliya of Allah, is still never going to be at the level of any of the Prophets and messengers. <coughs> so we do not say that any of the awliya of Allah have reached a level higher than the prophets and messengers. And that's important. Because that is exactly what some people appear to do these days. Where some of them begin to say their imam, great imam was high and superior and high ranking. And they begin to believe that he is some type of super individual of some super level that he didn't have to pray anymore. That's what they say. The Sufi Imams, they say some of our Imams, they get to such a level they don't have to pray anymore. So here Al Imam Al Tahawi is making clear. He's making clear that none of the awliya of Allah and these Sufis and their likes are not from the awliya in the first place, but from those who are from the awliya of Allah None of them is going to be superior than any of the prophets and messengers. All of the prophets and messengers are the most superior. Then after them, who is the superior? The Sahaba, the companions. And then after the companions comes the other awliya of Allah. So here he highlights, don't ever say and believe that any of the awliya of Allah are greater and superior to any of the prophets and messengers. And that's a bit like what we were talking about last week, that even the lowest ranking companion is superior to the highest ranking tabi'i. No matter how high ranking the tabi'een, the salaf, after them got to, None of them is comparable to a companion, even if it was the lowest ranking companion. Even if those tabi'een, some of them were more knowledgeable than some of the companions, they are not superior to them. Because every companion has something that nobody else after them can have, and that is companionship, meeting the Prophet ﷺ. And this is the same here. When it comes to the prophets and messengers, you cannot believe and say that any imam was so big that he's superior and greater than the prophets and the messengers. That makes absolutely no sense and it is absolutely incorrect. The prophets and messengers are superior. They are the chosen ones by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ones given revelation. The awliya, no matter how much they may be, they're not given revelation from Allah. So do not ever fall into this type of misguidance of some of the people believing that their imams 
and the the peer and whatever they may call it, that he is so far superior that he's reached the ultimate levels and he goes to paradise at night and walks around there and Allah talks to him. All of these lies that they make up. Lies that they make up. So beware of that. Then, Al-Imam Al-Tahawi says, وَنُؤْمِنُ بِمَا جَاءَ مِنْ كَرَامَاتِهِمْ We believe in the miracles of the true awliya of Allah. وَصَحَّ عَنِ الثِّقَاتِ مِنْ رِوَايَاتِهِمْ And that has been mentioned by authentic change of narration. The awliya of Allah, Allah may allow them some blessings that we may refer to as miracles. An example, it's mentioned in Sharh Usul I'tiqad Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'a of Imam Al Lalikai. He mentions a story in there about one of the awliya of Allah. One of the awliya of Allah on one occasion, a righteous great man, was walking through the jungle. Had to go through the jungle to get to where he needed to go. As he was walking through the jungle, all of a sudden in front of him, he was faced, confronted by a huge lion. And of course, typically what you would expect in that scenario is that the lion would pounce upon him, eat him perhaps. It's mentioned from the miracles, from the blessing that Allah gives His awliya, that lion stepped down, sat aside, and did not raise a single claw towards them. Sat aside, and the man just walked right past. That's a true story mentioned. And they say this is an example of what we would call the miracles of the awliya of Allah. That Allah allows these types of blessings for the righteous and the pious. That being an example there, that this wali from the awliya of Allah confronted by a lion, the lion should attack, kill this man. That is what is expected. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the lion to step down, to sit down aside and to move away and not touch him one bit. And the man calmly walks past they say that is an example of Allah allowing this wali from his awliya, that miracle at the time, that blessing that he was able to do that. So these are miracles of the awliya of Allah. And various other things of that nature may occur. How do we differentiate between that and what magicians do? How do we differentiate between that and what magicians do? Magicians do all types of things like that. How would we know if somebody is a magician or if this is from the miracles that Allah has allowed this true wali of Allah? You have to investigate that person. What is that person upon? Is that person upon the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is that person upon righteousness and piety? If he's not, he's a person who is not upon righteousness, not upon any type of piety. He's upon sinning and wrong. He maybe doesn't pray as the Sufi Imams believe they don't have to pray. Then that type of person, if some miracle like this happens, you know it is not one of the miracles of the awliya of Allah. He is not from the awliya of Allah for sure. He doesn't pray. He commits all types of other sins and wrongs. Then he's not from the awliya of Allah. So this miracle happening, it is not a miracle of the awliya of Allah. That may well be something to do with magic then. Because the person himself is not a person who is practicing the religion. Not a person who is pious and upright. So do not 
say that these miracles or something which is happening is a miracle from Allah to him. It's not. Those miracles that Allah allows to occur, then they are miracles to his awliya, truly who are righteous and upright. Of course, the Prophet Muhammad sallam at the head of all of the awliya of Allah, Prophet and Messenger superior than all of that. And there were many miracles that Allah gave the Prophet sallam. There were many miracles that Allah gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On one occasion it's mentioned that he was out with the army and they ran out of water. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Ali ibn Abi Talib and another one with him to go and search for water. So as they went searching for water, they were on a journey out in the deserts. They went searching for water, they came across a woman, a non-believing woman, a mushrika woman. And she was on a camel, and she had two water pouches, two bags full of water carrying it on the camel. So they asked her, where did you get that water from? She said there was some type of lake or river, 24 hours of traveling distance over there. She said, it's been a day since I picked up that water. I've been traveling on my camel for a day. So it's a day's worth of journeying to get back to that place now where I got this water from. So that was obviously too far. So they said to her, come with us then. You come with us to the Messenger Wasallam." So she went. And the Prophet Wasallam took some water from her. And it's mentioned in that example, obviously she only had two small pouches of water. This was a whole army. whole army was there. The Prophet ﷺ took a little bit of that water. And they say from the miracles that Allah bestowed upon him, the water began to flow out of his hands. The whole army came and drank from it and it sufficed them. And obviously that was only a tiny amount of water there. That is mentioned as an example. An example of the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And those miracles, various other forms of miracles, lesser in degree than that, like this example of the lion and things like that, that can occur for the awliya of Allah, for the righteous and the pious, that Allah allows them to have these miracles that occur. But like we said, you must distinguish between miracles and between magicians. And that distinction will occur by investigating what that person is upon. If that person is upon the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and he's righteous and upright, then that is possibly from the miracles what happens. But if that person is a sinner and a wrongdoer, then it is not from the miracles of Allah upon him. He is engaging in something else, maybe magic, maybe jinn, in performing what he is performing. The next section, we briefly covered it before, and it is the section that briefly talks about the signs of the hour. Al-Imam Al-Tahawi says, وَنُؤْمِنُ بِأَشْرَاطِ السَّاعَةِ We believe in the signs of the hour. مِنْ خُرُوجِ الدَّجَّالِ وَنُزُولِ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمِ عليه السلام من السماء ونؤمن بطلوع الشمس من مغربها وخروج دابة الأرض من موضعها here he mentions some of the signs of the Day of Judgment. That we believe in the exiting of the Dajjal and the return of Isa alayhi salam from the heavens and that the sun will rise up from the west and the beast that will exit from the earth and the other various signs. There is a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّهَا لَن تَقُومَ حَتَّى تَرَوْ عَشْرَ آيَاتِ The day of judgment will not occur until you see ten signs. 
until you see ten signs. Ad-Dukhan, Ad-Dajjal, Ad-Dabbah, Tulu'i al-Shams min Maghribiha, Nuzul Isa ibn Maryam, Ya Ajuj wa Ma'juj, Thalathat Khusuf, خصف بالمشرق وبالمغرب وبجزيرة العرب وآخر ذلك نار تخرج من اليمن تطرد الناس إلى محشرهم Ten signs are mentioned in this particular hadith One is the, the fog that will arise One is the Dajjal that will come and we've spoken about some of these before. The Dajjal, when he comes, for example, how long does he stay on this earth? We discussed that last time. How long does the Dajjal stay upon this earth when it comes? 40 days, but the first day is like a year, and the second day is like a month, and the third day is like a week, and the rest of the days are like normal days so how much does that add up to in our time frames how much does that add up to in our time frames one year two months and 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 a couple of weeks. One year, two months, and a couple of weeks. That's what it adds up to in our time frames. So the Dajjal will come, written upon his head, Kaf, Fa, Ra, Kafara, or in some narrations, Kafir. And every believer will be able to see that, even the ones who were illiterate. They don't even know how to read. But when the Dajjal comes, the believers will be able to read that. Kafir. Kafara, disbeliever, disbelieved. So the Dajjal will come, there will be the beast, there will be the rising of the sun from the west. And when the sun rises from the west, that is the time when Tawbah will no longer be accepted. When the people see that the sun rises from the west, they'll all want to make Tawbah, but then it's too late. Then they will all know the reality and the truth, but then it's too late. And also the descent of Isa alayhi salam coming back. Ya'juj and Ma'juj, Gog and Magog. And three eclipses. One in the east, one in the west, and one in the Arabian Peninsula. And the last of those signs is a fire that will gather the people to the land of resurrection. A fire that will gather the people to the land of resurrection. So these are known as the major signs of the hour. The major signs of the hour. Because they are mentioned all together in that narration. Uh, ten of them and they are from the amazing affairs. How many different types of the signs of the hour are there? How many different types of the signs of the hour are there? Uh, two, minor and major. So some scholars have mentioned that the signs of the hour can be categorized as minor and major. Major signs being those that we just mentioned and everything else being minor signs. What is another way to categorize the signs of the hour? So you can categorize it in terms of time frames. Signs of the hour that have already gone by Signs of the hour that are occurring around us right now and signs of the hour that will occur in the future. Signs that have already gone like the death of the Prophet That's a sign of the hour getting close. Signs occurring right now, you could mention all types of things, the alcohol, fornication, killing, various things which are signs of the hour. And signs that will happen in the future, you could mention those major signs. So you can say signs past, present and future. Or you can categorize as minor and major. These are all various signs of the hour that will occur before the day of judgment is established. That's where we'll leave it for today. Next session could possibly be the last session on At-Tahawiyyah.
we may finish the book next session. Possibly next session, depending on how we do it, we may finish the book next week. So inshallah ta'ala next week, or certainly no more than two sessions, certainly no more than two sessions, if not next week, the week after, we'll be concluding and finishing this book inshallah ta'ala. So some of the brothers, mashallah, they've attended right from the beginning. Right from the beginning. That means you will have completed the whole of this book, the Aqeedah of Al-Imam Al-Tahawi, learning the various aspects of Aqeedah of Ahl sunnah So any questions on that for tonight? The major signs that are mentioned was the fog, there was the Dajjal, there was the beast, there was Gog and Magog, there was the return of Isa alayhi salam, there was the rising of the sun from the west, there were the three eclipses, and then there was the fire that gathers the people to the land of resurrection. Are they, are they all in order, or is it it's enough to them as well? What's the order of the signs? Which one will happen first? The Mahdi. I think it's the Mahdi is, you could say, pre-major signs. Fire. The Mahdi comes, the Mahdi comes, and then straight after the Mahdi, or during while the Mahdi is here, the major signs start to begin. So the Mahdi is like pre-major signs. Is it the so the first major sign is the coming of the Dajjal. Second? The return of Isa alayhi salam. Third? Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog arising is the third. Fourth? The beast. Three eclipses. Three eclipses. There's something about the fourth being not sure. So what's the fifth then? Smoke. Eclipse. Yeah, something about yeah. the fifth. I'm not sure. So what about the sixth then? <laughs> <laughs> so the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh, and the eighth, and the ninth, those are unknown in which order they will come. But the tenth is known. The seventh one. The fire that will gather the people to the land of resurrection, that is the tenth sign. So from four to nine, the order is not known precisely. Sunnah doesn't precisely mention which order that would happen. First three are mentioned, Dajjal, then Isa alayhi salam, then Gog and Magog. Then the next four to nine are not specified which order the tenth one is the fire that will gather the people to the land of resurrection. At what point do all the believers have the soul taken? Is it at the time of the fire or after? Before. Because it is mentioned when the hour is established, when the day of judgment then occurs, it occurs and only the most evil of people are left on the earth. Any believers left at that time, right at the end, their souls are taken first. Only the most evil of the people are left and upon them the day of judgment strikes. <coughs> so they are removed just prior to that. Um, in our homelands where Shirk is quite manifest, a lot of the people that go to these thieves say that they don't ask us to do shirk or do anything just like that. They say they tell us to read Quran and pray, and, you know, and the likes of that. How can we advise them that they're not really, you know, righteous people? They actually are magicians. What advice can we give them when they say that they're righteous people or they tell us to do good? You look at their practice. Those people, from their practices, you can see they're not just righteous people as they claim. Look at the types of things that they do. Most of them are engaged in magic. Most of them, when they say we're doing ruqya, they're not doing ruqya, they're reciting all types of weird and wonderful things. 
All this kind of activity you see from them, you can tell these people are not upon the sunnah. Even uh, many of them when you go and then people start throwing their money at them and all types of things, they go and they say we can't have kids and the imam wipes on them. These are small things people might not pay attention to. They are things which are completely in opposition to Tawheed and Sunnah. The imam wiping on you, making some dua for you like he's got some power to give you a child. That's the kind of thing they do. So there are subtle things that most people may not be aware of. They think it's just nothing. He's, he's a practicing person. He made dua for us. But they are actually doing more than that. So you have to look at the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Are they practicing it or are they upon bid'ah and innovation? If they sit in the mosques with the lights turned off and everything as well, they're upon bid'ah, innovation. They're not from the awliya of Allah. There you go. That's another example of something they do. And they claim it is ruqya, they claim they're doing this, they claim they're doing that. And they're really making physical contact with women, which is haram, etc. The belief of 70,000 to uh, Jannah and those that do seek Rukia. Mm. Um, I think I got confused. What kind of Rukia is it? The innovative type of Rukia, like with shirk in it, or is it any type of Rukia? <coughs> any type of Rukia. It means that they don't go out there basically begging people to do Rukia for them. Like you hear people these days now. The minute something goes wrong, ringing up everybody, do you know anybody who can do Rukia? Do you know anybody who can do Rukia? All the time, people are asking around, we need someone to do ruqya. That's the kind of thing you're not supposed to do. All the time, we need someone to do ruqya. Something's happened, can somebody come and read? You don't know how to read the Qur'an yourself? You can't even read the Qur'an. Why do you have to go look for somebody to do ruqya? So the hadith is talking about the people who do that kind of thing. Who seek it. Who are seeking it always. Who can do ruqya for us? Can you find someone for us? We need somebody to come and read our name. That kind of thing. When somebody is so attached looking all the time, we need someone for ruqya, we need someone for reading, something's gone wrong with my kid, with me. That type of behavior is not sweet to it. It shows that you haven't got your trust in Allah. To relax, calm down, do some reading yourself. Do some reading yourself on your child, on yourself, whatever it might be. Not just blindly, any, anything happens straight to pick up the phone. Do you know anybody who can do ruqya? Is anybody in leads? Anybody here? That type of thing is not good. That's what takes you out of your full trust in Allah. Ruqya is permissible. It's not haram. Permissible. The Prophet ﷺ had ruqya, didn't he? He used to do ruqya to other people. It's permissible. But what's wrong is this kind of thing. People, every two minutes, we need somebody to come and read on us. We need to find someone who can do ruqya. There's magic, there's this, there's that. Just going crazy all the time. They need to calm down. Ruqya, read the Qur'an. Read the Qur'an upon the person, etc. Calm down in your family. Instead of all the time, we need someone to do this, we need someone to do that. That type of thing is the wrong thing. Hijama is good to do, but you have to go to the person who knows how to do it upon the sunnah, somebody who can do it properly, somebody who can do the hijama upon the sunnah, and there are brothers here who do it. So you can go to those brothers and they'll do it properly, inshallah ta'ala. Alright, we'll round off on that for tonight. Carry on next week, inshallah ta'ala. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين